Let's talk about arrows versus armor in the late medieval period and specifically looking at arrowheads and should they be made of steel or not? Hi folks, Matt Eaton here, Scholar Gladiatoria. Now, as many of you watching this will know, Todd recently on Todd's Workshop channel has been doing the arrows versus armor 2 testing testing all sorts of parameters, answering all sorts of questions, and um, I've been fantastically enjoying it, as I'm sure you have as well. And I wanted to contribute something to the discussion. Obviously, you guys know I collaborate with Todd fairly regularly, and I thought, what can I bring to the party here? And I thought, I'll bring the history. So I've been delving into the primary source material for arrowheads. Now what I'm not specifically looking at in this video are types of arrowheads or designs of arrow or even really looking very much at the results um, of what uh, has been shown in Todd's test but I'm specifically looking at the examples from the text sources talking about how arrowheads were supplied, made and what they were made of in this period, you know, the Hundred Years' War, the Wars of the Roses, so we're talking primarily 14th and 15th centuries and English sources. So specifically talking about English longbowmen's arrowheads. I'm only fleetingly going to look at the archaeologically found arrowheads because we do actually have a lot of arrowheads from archaeology, particularly from the Battle of Towson Battlefield. And Will Sherman, who made this arrow that I'm holding here and also made the arrows in Todd's films, um, has also contributed to uh, my video here behind the scenes, giving me some uh, you know, discussing and giving me some advice. Uh, but, so we're not going to be looking at the archaeology in this video, but we, we might look that in a, at that in a future video. Here we're going to specifically look at the written historical sources talking about the arrowheads and what that can tell us more about this topic. Now, very pertinently to this video, I've just been watching a series hosted by Ray Mears on History Hit, who are the kind sponsors of this video. And they've got a fantastic offer for you here, which would be a great gift for yourself or for one of your loved ones over the festive period. So as regular viewers will know, I've been obsessed with history my entire life and I've made it into my whole career. I was briefly an archeologist and of course I've made my career here on YouTube. And in fact, I'm also an antique dealer as well. So I deal in history. And that's why an absolute gift for me or anybody else obsessed with history is History Hit. It's like taking all of your favorite history documentaries and putting them into one place where you can access anywhere, anytime. History Hit brings you the stories that shaped the world through their award-winning podcast network and their online history channel. It's kind of like Netflix, but it's all history. You can watch hundreds of hours of original content anywhere on any device anytime. Hosted by expert historians such as Dan Snow, Professor Susanna Lipscomb or Dan Jones for example. Now as well as already being able to find hundreds of programs already online there, they add two more every week. And every week, History Hit launched 19 new episodes across eight different podcasts, which also includes the world's leading history podcast, which is Dan Snow's History Hit. So very pertinent to this video, I've recently been watching Ray Mears' The Bow, The History of Archery. Of course, it features Ray Mears himself, who you probably know from previous documentaries, but also people like Todd of Todd's Workshop and other friends of ours. First episode covered prehistory, um, bows and archery equipment all the way up to 1066, and the second episode looked at the Hundred Years War, the Wars of the Roses, and the Merry Rose Bows. So how do you get access, I hear you cry? Well, actually, I've got a great, great offer for you here. For viewers of Scholar Gladiatoria channel, I've got a special offer, which is a really, really good one. Best offer I've seen for this. If you hit that link in the description just below, down there, you will get 60%, that's 60% off your first six months. And this amazing offer means that you're gonna be getting History Hit for only three pounds a month for the next six months. And thank you very much to History Hit for sponsoring this channel and this video. Now before we delve into those primary sources, I just want you to consider for a moment the arrow and its likely effect on any type of thing that it might be hitting, but in this case we're talking about plate armour, okay, different parts of plate armour. And specifically there are a few things which characterise what effect this will have on the armour when it hits it. They include, obviously, mass, Velocity, they've all, all been dealt with by uh, Todd and his team. The cross-sectional shape, so once it's entered the target, if it enters the target, the cross-sectional shape which relates to friction and resistance. Uh, also we could call drag, okay? There's elements to the arrow's design which uh, contributes to its drag, but also friction 
as it goes into the target. The hardness and toughness, two separate things, of the head, okay, have a very pertinent effect. And then also the structure of the arrow. You'll notice in a lot of the tests which Todd has done, the arrow head broke most often at the socket, the socket exploded, and in many, many cases, the shaft broke. Now, I'm not gonna go into all of those elements in this video, but I just want you to bear those things in mind, and all of these things will uh, change the effects that we see on the target downrange. Okay, everything to do with the way the shaft is constructed, what type of wood it is, how stiff it is, how heavy it is, obviously the mass and velocity, but also the structure and design of the head, its cross section, how strong the socket is, how the socket is attached to the shaft, what happens to that socket. If you again, if you look at the slow motion videos, you can see very often when this strikes armor, the socket was being driven down onto the shaft and the shaft was bursting the socket. If you could prevent that from happening, potentially you might get more of the energy instead of being expended here, would be expended at the tip on penetration and these kinds of things. But coming back to the main point of this video, we're specifically going to be looking at the material of the heads. Now something I want to be absolutely crystal clear about is no matter what historical data we might be looking at here and whatever my beliefs might be, I don't think in any way that undermines the, the testing that we've seen done in arrows versus armor one and two. Um, numerous types of arrowhead material have been tested um, and purely I think this is bringing another aspect to the greater study of this and potentially opening up possible future avenues for future testing and research. Um, but it is absolutely undeniable that the vast majority of medieval arrowheads that we have found archaeologically, most famously from the Battle of Towton um, battlefield, have been of iron or mild steel equivalent. And I'd also like to give a very quick shout out to Mike Chernett who works closely with Todd and does a lot of Todd's uh, filming and editing and that kind of stuff and does a huge amount of work behind the scenes on Arrows versus Armour 1 and 2. And he has shared the footage, uh, his, his footage and Todd's footage here, which you will see little clips of in this video. So thanks to Mike. And just briefly before we delve into the primary sources again, I want to reiterate that Will Sherman's arrows used in in Todd's tests. They actually used a number of different arrowheads, including some steel provided, I believe, by Owen Bush. So they used um, steel heads, they used case hardened heads, and they used iron, wrought iron heads or mild steel heads. And that's a variety of materials, and they did exhibit some differences on the target. You will note that the case hardened heads that were tested on the plate armor did bite into it, and in one case actually left the tip of the arrowhead in the steel. And that was not something that was really exhibited with the raw iron or mild steel heads. So there was some difference exhibited on the plate armor when they use different materials. Although a thing that I thought was particularly interesting was there wasn't a particularly big difference between uh, when they shot through the flat steel plate between the steel head and the case hardened head. So now let's delve into these primary sources. I've actually put a document together which I'm gonna share with you on my personal website and I will link it below. So if you want to read these sources for yourself, you can actually go to that PDF linked down there on my website, check it out. And I'm gonna be doing this in the future with future videos, research videos like this, where I have provided a, a document of a research that might be useful for other people to use in the future and refer to. Why not share it with you guys so you get more out of it than just this video. You also get the, uh, you know, the document that you can refer back to in the future. So the first and earliest document is from Edward III's reign. And this is from the calendar of close roles, Edward III, um, 1337 to 1339. In fact, this particular quote is taken from March 1337. To put that into historical context, right at the beginning of the Hundred Years' War, this is years before what's uh, nine years before the Battle of Cressy, okay? So, you know, this is pretty damned early for someone to be looking at the regulation of arrows and the construction of arrowheads. So, he says, this is an order to cause the same sheriff to have due allowance in his account for the costs which he shall have reasonably incurred in the following matters. Having viewed the indenture at the king, um, that the king ordered the sheriff to cause 300 good and sufficient bows and cords suited to them, so bowstrings, and a ton of arrows, 
an L long each of good and dry timber. We'll notice the timber, the wood, referred to numerous times in these sources. And this is the important part, well steeled heads. 1337. What does that mean, well steeled heads? We'll talk about that later. For those arrows and with broad barbs for the king's use, to be brought and purveyed from the um, issues of the bailwick and to be sent to York, to be delivered to the sheriff of York by indenture and by virtue of his order, John brought 300 good bows and cords suitable for them and a pipe of arrows containing 146 sheaves with the heads thereof and delivered them to the Sheriff of York for the King's use as may be fully appear by an indenture made thereon, as he says. <laughs> Lots of superfluous words in these documents. But basically it's these well-steeled heads. What does well-steeled heads mean? Well, presumably it means involving steel somehow. Could be steel, could be case hardened. We'll talk more about that as we go along but they are specifying that the wood must be good dry wood, um, and that's referred to in many of the later sources, and that the heads should involve steel. Why would a person be bo bothered about, and notice that also in medieval documents they differentiate between iron and steel. They didn't necessarily realise that steel is just iron with a bit of carbon in it, um, and you can carburise iron by putting your iron in a, a, a furnace, a, a, a forge, with charcoal for example, and it will absorb the carbon into the surface and you can carburise the outer surface. You can essentially make the outer surface of a piece of steel, piece of iron, sorry, into steel. And that will make it harder, okay? So they were clearly, Edward III already in 3037 was already bothered about the uh, manufacture of the heads and what they were made of. Why? Presumably because they wanted the heads to be hard for some reason. Why might they want our heads to be hard? Probably to stand a better chance of getting through something. Um, perhaps for some reason they found iron heads were unsatisfactory, insufficient. We can talk about that more as we go along. So, still in the reign of Edward III, this is from 1341, in fact, April the 18th, uh, in Westminster, to be precise, very well recorded records. To the Sheriff of York, order to cause 500 white bows, that means unpainted, and 500 sheaves of arrows at 12 pence for the bow and 14 pence a sheaf for steeled arrows and 12 pence for non-steeled arrows to be brought and purveyed and taken to the port of Orwell to there at Whitsonside, uh, I think Whitson, Whitsontide, next at uh, latest to be delivered to those um, disputed to receive them as the king needs a great number of bows and arrows for his war in France on account of the passage which he will shortly make to those parts in armed force and the sheriff shall not omit to do this under pain of forfeiture. Again this is 1341 so this is before the famous Cressy campaign but Amazing sources. So in 1341, uh, they actually price steeled arrows and non-steeled arrows. And for a sheaf of steeled arrows, it was 14 pence. And for a sheaf of non-steeled arrows, it was 12 pence, which is actually no surprise uh, because iron arrows are far cheaper, far quicker and easier to make than steeled arrows. What are steeled arrows? I would argue at that percentage difference, 14 pence versus 12 pence, it's not huge. So we're probably talking about case hardening. That is my interpretation of what steeled means. So in other words, they have been, I think the term is carburized, they've been put with a carbon, in a carbon rich environment to absorb carbon so that you have ended up with an outer casing of steel, essentially, with a steel tip, which as we saw in Todd's tests, does make a difference to the target on a piece of steel plate. Now I'm not arguing that this is definitely for penetration of plate, but it's clearly for penetration of something. If you're going to the extra cost and time and effort of making steeled heads and ordering them and buying them, you want them for something. Why would you want steeled heads if they don't do something that the non-steeled heads don't do as well? Okay, so fascinating, fascinating source. Now we jump forward to 1359, November the 8th, in Windsor this time. To the Sheriff of Lincoln, order upon pain of forfeiture to cause 400 painted bows, 200 white bows, that's a very interesting topic, painted bows versus white bows, we'll talk about that another time, and a thousand sheaves of arrows 
well pointed to be brought and purveyed so that he have them at the Tower of London, which is the state arsenal essentially, on the octaves of St Andrew next, that's uh, uh, time of year, to be delivered by indenture to William de Rothwell, keeper of the wardrobe there. And if by reason of some impediment he cannot have them promptly before the day to send um, £145 16 shillings and 8 pence to the receipt of the exchequer on that day to purvey as many bows and arrows as the king must have a great number of bows and arrows speedily for his furtherance of his war with France. This is 1359. So now we've jumped forward. We're past Crecy, we're past uh, Poitiers, but obviously the war is still going full steam. So the um, the ordering, the manufacture, the supply, the storage and preservation, the transportation of bows and arrows was a massive undertaking at this time, a huge concern of the Crown of England in their war in France. And essentially it, it's the precursor to modern um, supply of ammunition, for example, in the military. And it's no surprise that the War Department of the Victorian era used the arrowhead as their symbol. The arrowhead became the symbol of British military um, supply chain, essentially. Okay, so the, the, the WD broad arrow. But again, it says well pointed. So they are concerned about the points and it's very important to keep noting that through continuous sources. So here we have still in the reign of Edward III from February 1368 now, we've come forward a decade and a bit, February the 5th in Westminster, London, to the Sheriff of Northampton. Order for particular causes of the issues of his bailwick to cause 800 sheaves of arrows in places where he shall see best to be made and pervade seasoned and not of green wood. Now this is a point that comes up repeatedly in the same sources that talk about the quality of the heads. So there were some people who to meet their obligations of arrow manufacture and possibly to save money <laughs> or make a bit on the side, they'd been using unseasoned wood, green wood. And this is clearly not optimal because they're likely to warp as they dry out. They probably are not as stiff um, and they just don't perform so well. So not only are they concerned about arrowheads, but they're also concerned about the shafts. Um, as he will answer it before the king and to be fitted with steel heads to the pattern of the iron head which shall be delivered to him on the king's behalf, sending the same to the Tower of London before Midsummer next, there to be delivered to John de Sleaford, the king's clerk, keeper of his wardrobe in the said Tower, Tower of London, knowing assuredly that if the same be not, ma not be made of seasoned wood, the king will charge him with the cost over and above punishment he will inflict. So clearly there has been a supply of, in, of poor quality arrows and they're very concerned with this not happening again upon severe punishment financial and sometimes imprisonment so they are taking the quality of arrows extremely seriously but just talking about the heads the real like absolute thunderclap of whoa information in this is not only does it says say that they have to be fitted with steel heads whether that means completely solid steel heads or um, sort of carburized or case hardened, I don't know, uh, but it just says steel heads. And bear in mind that the words in French and Latin and English for steel and iron are different things. They considered them different materials. With steel heads to the pattern of the iron head, which shall be delivered to him. You might, if you're wondering what that means. So if we jump forward to the 19th century and you, you've you heard me talk about sword patterns, the 1796 pattern, the 1822 pattern, blah, blah, blah. What these were, were a model of a sword that was sent to a place where manufacturers could copy the design. So when they go away and start manufacturing the thing, it will be exactly the same as the officially royally decreed and stamped and authorized version. And they could actually come back, they could bring back the saber they'd made, sword they'd made and compare it to the one, the official pattern. Yes, it meets pattern. Now they've got one and they make lots more of them and they all match that pattern. This is incidentally is the same manufacturing process that I have used in with companies I've worked with when we've got the approved final prototype that is kept as a pattern and all of the others that are made are to be compared with that. It's a very simple and probably goes back 
certainly hundreds of years, as we see here, possibly even thousands of years, it might go back to the Roman period, a, a way of um, introducing quality control and consistency. And blowing my mind, this was something in 1368 they were doing with arrowheads. Not only were they specifying that this arrowhead, we want you to make exactly the same as this, but in steel, so they're specifying steel rather than iron, but moreover, they're specifying the design of it. What design was it? Well, we don't know. Maybe at this time it was a Type 16 head? We don't know. Maybe it was a type of bodkin at this date? We don't know. Um, this is something we can look at in a future video. The design of arrowheads is a very, very complex topic and I might bring in external experts for that. But purely looking at the material, it is absolutely explicit that in 1368, the king was wishing all arrowheads to be made of steel, not of iron. So if we jump forward one year to 1369 now, October the 27th, Westminster, London, to the Sheriff of London and Middlesex, order on sight of these presents forthwith of the issues of their bailwick to cause 1,000 sheaves of arrows of good and seasoned wood, important, and not of green wood, as they will answer it before the king himself, to be made and purveyed in the said city and county within liberties and without to be fitted with heads of steel. <laughs> and come before Easter next to the Tower of London to be delivered by indenture to John de Sleaford, the King's clerk, we've heard about him already, keeper of the wardrobe there, any assignments of payments to be made to any persons by letters patent, writs under the great or privy seal, uh, tallies or letters of the treasurer to other, uh, or other of the king's commands, however made, notwithstanding, knowing assuredly that unless the said sheaves be made of seasoned wood and brought before the feast of the tower, the king will cause the sheriffs um, upon the view of their account on the morrow of the close of Easter next to be arrested and imprisoned their lands, goods and chattels to be seized into his hand and the said sheaves to be brought and purveyed um, of the issues thereof and will further cause them um, as he may be uh, in such wise punishment that their punishment shall be a terror to others who neglect the execution of the king's commands as the king has particular information that his adversaries of France and other his enemies to them adhering are making ready with a host of ships and armed men to destroy the navy of the realm to hinder the passage of the merchants and merchandise thereof and destroy the merchants um, and other of the king's lieges by every means that they may, if not speedily opposed with a strong hand, and it is the king's will to resist their malice and make provision for the safety of the realm and of the ships, merchants and merchandise thereof. This is serious business. This is, you know, this is fear of invasion, uh, you know, kind of 1939 kind of stuff. But the important part here is the king is now bringing extremely tough punishments in for arrows that don't make the grade. That he's specifying that it has to be of good dried wood, seasoned wood, not green wood, and he is again specifying steel heads. So this was a very tense period for Edward III. So this is still 1369, July the 8th, Westminster, London. To the sheriffs of Lancaster, order under pain of forfeiture without any delay to cause the 600 sheaves of arrows by the king commanded of seasoned wood and not of green, as he will answer it before the king, to be purveyed in his bailwick with the li within liberties and without, fitted with heads of steel after the pattern of the iron head delivered to him on the king's behalf. So again, we've come back to there was an iron head sent out to these various sheriffs of different areas and they were told you are to make these arrows immediately to this number 600 sheaves in this case um, and they must be of seasoned wood they must be of steel heads and the head will, must match the iron pattern of this head if you don't do it there's going to be all hell to pay this is like serious serious and the rest of this document is pretty much the same as the previous one this is serious business so the king, whether he was getting them or not, I can't answer that question. Uh, whether all of the arrows in the Tower of London were made of steel or iron or they were a mixture, I can't answer that question. But it is very, very clear that the supply of arrows was extremely seriously taken by Edward III and that the preference was for, obviously, for seasoned wood for the shafts and steel for the heads.
according to the pattern, according to the design which had been sent out. So here we just jump forward a couple of years to 1371, February the 14th, Westminster, to the Sheriff of York this time, order for particular causes on sight of these um, presents forthwith of the issues of his bail work to cause 1,000 sheaves of arrows over and above those which the king lately commanded him to purvey to his use. So he's ordering a, another batch, basically. To be made and purveyed in his bail work, within liberties and without, of good and seasoned wood and not of green wood as he will answer it before the king himself you see a lot of repeated text here and to cause those to be newly made as those formerly commanded so in other words those ones we ordered before we want more of those um, which are in arrears to be made with steel heads and come to the Tower of London before the Quinzane of Trinity next, there to be delivered by indenture, uh, indenture sorry, to John de Sleaford, uh, um, the King's Club, blah, blah, blah. And it goes on pretty much the same as the previous one. So again, it's um, specifying, uh, and I'm just looking at it, it, in fact, this document specifies the same information again within the same paragraph. So they're really, really on top of this wood issue and the steel issue. It was important to them. Now everyone knows that Edward III was a sort of legend in English history. He was a, a great um, warrior, a great leader, you could say a great king. Whatever you think about the Hundred Years' War, it was a period of great wealth and success for the English monarchy. Um, however, Richard II, not so successful <laughs> at all, but even under Richard II's reign, and bear in mind he oversaw things like the Peasants Revolt and stuff, even under his reign we have this document from 1385, October the 16th, Westminster, to Nicholas Brembra, Mayor of the City of London. So this time it's an order to, to, to London to provide something. Order by advice of the council to cause all in singular the Fletchers of the city to come before him. So I want to see all the Fletchers here. And under a straight and fitting pain to lay down such an order touching their craft, that all arrows by them um, exposed for sale shall be wrought of good and sufficient wood. So essentially he's making it law that anyone in London selling arrows not of uh, good wood is going to be punished. Suitably feathered, okay, um, and the heads good and hard. Now that doesn't use the word steel, however, <laughs> If we're being realistic, how would you make wrought iron good and hard? The way I read this in the context of all the documents is they're talking about steel. And potentially this is implying hardened steel, not just we want some carbon in our heads, but we also want them heat treated. Uh, because how else, apart from work hardening, um, which, you know, work hardening is one way of hardening something, but by and large, given that we've already got all these documents talking about steel arrowheads, well, if you've now got Richard III saying heads good and hard, that means hardened steel in, in, in my books. Uh, I mean, that's where I'd put my money. It's not 100% certain, but it seems to be extremely likely. Uh, on the king's behalf, charging the Fletchers under the pain truly to observe such ordinance and chastising from time to time all who shall contravene the same. So this is also a confirmation that there were people not making st steel heads. There were people making not good enough quality heads and clearly using greenwood for shafts. Otherwise, they wouldn't need to keep reiterating this um, and emphasising this exact same ruling. Uh, so it was clearly a problem, but we can also tell from it what they wanted, and we can also tell that sometimes they weren't getting it. Um, which the king's will is that they cause to be enrolled in the chamber of the Gihal of uh, jail, that is actually, it's a strange spelling of the word, jail of London. So he's basically saying, look, if you sell arrows without sufficiently hard heads um, using Greenwood, you're going to jail, mate. And jail was horrible at that time. Very different to now. Not to say jail's nice now, but very horrible then. Uh, as he would make effective provision on every side matters which concern the advantage of the defence of the realm. And he's looking more at defence than offence uh, in his reign. But... Clearly, even under Richard, uh, Richard II's reign, it's an extremely serious matter, the quality of the heads and the quality of the shafts. So jumping forward to Henry IV's reign now, and obviously 
some people would regard him as an usurper. Um, he's from uh, the line of Lancaster and, and you know, it, not necessarily the, um, the, the rightful king, but he was nevertheless a very formidable military leader. And this is represented also in his actions and also some of the texts that remain from his reign, and this is one of them. And it's quite a famous one. It's been produced in a few books, um, although I don't think anyone else has ever reproduced the whole thing. They've quoted bits of it. So I'm going to go through the whole thing here as quickly as possible. And it is called The Ordnance of the Fletchers, and it dates to 1403. Um, so... It says, Ordinance of the Trade of Fletchers made by John Walcott, who's the mayor of the City of London, and the aldermen, his officials, on the 16th day of June, um, in the fourth year of the reign of Henry IV, um, and which was proclaimed on the 20th day of June in the year aforesaid, 1403. Okay. In the first place, that the folks of the said trade in the said city shall have power every year at the feast of St. Edward the, fi um, Edward the King, which is the 5th of January, to elect two persons to be wardens of the trade, to survey and make search during the year, when next ensuing to all matters of arrows and heads and of arrows and quarrels, as well as citizens as of foreigners. So it applies to everyone in the city, regardless of whether you're English or not, within the said city. And that they shall have power to seize such artillery, that means projectiles, um, as shall be found to be false and deceitful. So in other words, if you found one of Greenwood and you found one of uh, insufficiently made heads, anything to do with quality, you can seize them and the person you've seized them from has no recompense whatsoever. So in a way, the people doing the seizing have potentially a financial interest to find, oh, I think this shaft's a little bit green, I'll be having that sheaf of arrows. Um, so they're actually incentivized to police their own industry, effectively. So to seize those found to be false and dece deceitful, as well in houses and the king's highway, so on roads as well as um, private houses, as in every other place within the franchise of the said city, and to present the same to the mayor and alderman for the time being, there to be forfeited and destroyed, which is interesting. Were they destroyed? Was there some underhand business? We don't know. The persons who shall have made such false work to be punished and immersed and at the discretion of the said mayor and alderman for the time being, one half of such immersement to go to the use of the chamber and the other half to the use of the said trade. This is really tough policing now. So they're really, really on top of this. Henry IV is tough. Also, that no one of the said trade, citizen or foreigner, shall sell in any place within the franchise of the said city any work of such trade pertaining to warfare before that it has been assayed by the said wardens. In other words, they're looking at a proofing, a, an approval process now. As being good and able for the advantage of the king and of the realm on pain of forfeiture and immersement in form aforesaid, like said before. So always that the wardens of the said trade shall be ready and at all fitting times to assay such artillery on pain of making fine at the discretion of the mayor and alderman. Also that the said wardens shall have power so often as they shall please to cause search to be made in every place within the franchise of the city to see that all arrows and quarrels in the said trade are made of good and dry wood and that the heads of the arrows and quarrels are hard. Again, if it was wrought iron, I mean, you can't get softer than wrought iron. So by saying hard, to my thinking, that means hardened steel. That so, no arrows or quarrel, quarrels made by night, nor yet by day, in deceit or prejudice of the king and of the realm, and that those who are rebellious against the said wardens, in other words, who argue with the wardens, if any such shall be found, shall be punished by advice of the mayor and alderman, the same as rebels in any other trades of the city, provided always that all manner of folks, freemen and foreigners, having and bringing to the city um, broad wares and bolts to sell, sorry, broad arrows and bolts to sell, it's a strange spelling of broad arrows, and bolts to sell, shall not be restricted by this ordinance, uh, but may freely sell the same without survey or search by the wardens aforesaid. Also, that 
no one of the said trade shall sell in any way to any alien, foreigner, any manner of work belonging to such trade before that he has had a special leave from the king. So in other words, to sell arrows to the Scots, which you wouldn't be allowed to do at this time, uh, you'd need special permission from the king. Um, so uh, Scots isn't a good example because they were enemies at this point. Let's say the Belgians, the Flemish. Okay, And it is known that the same is not to be prejudice of the king or of the realm on pain of forfeiture of the work and of being punished and immersed at the discretion of the mayor and alderman according to the extent and offence. Now one part of this text which I don't fully certainly understand is this bit that says so it says all of the restrictions about the quality of the arrows and the punishments if they're not of the right quality and that people can search your home or your business or your wagon on the roads uh, to check that the arrows are of the good quality but there is this one bit of text that says provided always that all manner of folks freemen and foreigners having and bringing to the city broad arrows and bolts to sell shall not be restricted by this ordinance, but may freely sell the same without survey or search by the wardens aforesaid. So that seems to be saying that broad arrows and bolts aren't restricted by this ordinance, which if I understand correctly means hunting heads, which is a very useful thing to know if I've interpreted this source correctly, because that implies that broad arrows, and other sort of the big winged type used for hunting, um, hunting various types of game, those aren't the type of arrows that need to be made of steel. They can be made of iron, which means that we're specifically talking about, and we know that anyway because they keep referring to defence of the realm, military arrowheads and that they recognise that military arrowheads should be made well hard and steeled but broad arrowheads for hunting didn't need to be. If I've interpreted that correctly I think that's an extremely important piece of information to make note of. So moving forward to 1406 there is a note um, in the Parliament Rolls um, and you can, again, if you check out that document below, you can find all of my sources with the citations for all of these. Um, and it says, also, the Commons, um, the House of Commons, pray that because arrowsmiths make numerous defective heads for arrows and quarrels, which is neither good, lawful, nor defensible, to the great jeopardy and deception of the people of all the kingdom, it should be ordained in this present Parliament that all the heads of arrows and quarrels which are made henceforth shall be welded, brazed and hardened at the tip with steel. And if any of the said Arrowsmiths acts to the contrary, that he shall be forfeit all such heads and quarrels to the king, and shall be imprisoned and pay a fine for this at the king's will, and that every arrow or quarrel head shall be marked with an indication of who made it, a maker's mark, presumably, well, who knows, on the socket, on the head, I don't know, and that power shall be given to justices of the peace to inquire into all such deceitful makers of heads and quarrels in each county and punish them in the aforesaid manner. Uh, the answer to this proposal was, the king wills it. Adding to this, that the mayors, sheriffs and bailiffs of the cities and boroughs shall have similar powers of inquiry and punishment within the cities and boroughs in the manner stated in this petition. This was a petition in the House of, um, House of Parliament. So, uh, you know, what does that mean? Welded, brazed and hardened at the tip with steel. Well, the last part of that expression is the easiest. Tipped at the head with steel. Uh, now, does it mean just tipped at the end of the arrowhead with steel? In other words, with a forge welded tip of steel on an iron body, does it mean that it was somehow carburized, um, absorbs carbon in a carbon rich environment so it becomes steely, like well steeled as we saw in earlier sources near the tip? It could be any of the above. But then you've got this welded and brazed. This might imply that they were forge welding, like with a knife, carbon steel uh, point, tip, or possibly blades onto an iron body or a mild steel body. Who knows? I actually spoke with Will Sherman about this and he, he knows this source. Um, and this is, this is an open topic. We don't know the answer. And the problem is archaeologically. I've said I'm not going to look so much at the archaeology of arrows in this video. I'll save that for a future video. But all of the archaeological arrows we found from Towton and elsewhere seem to be iron. Uh, but... 
is that because the steel has simply been corroded away? Because we might be talking about such a thin casing of steel, just a little steel tip, or just, you know, case hardened, kind of like uh, uh, carburized kind of surface, that archaeologically we might not see any trace of that anyway. I am a form, former archaeologist, and I'll tell you, most pieces of iron out of the ground have lost their surface. All you've got is the body. So if you've only got the core, yes, that's going to be iron. That doesn't necessarily tell us what the surface and the tip of them was. Uh, but anyway, that's all conjecture, and we'll talk a bit more about that at the end of this video. Right, this is a growing document, and I'm still in the process of looking at later periods, um, but I've pulled a few together. This one is from the reign of Henry V and is from 1417. In fact, Henry V released various um, uh, pieces of information, written documents from his reign regarding arrows. But here's one, 1417. February the 10th, Westminster, it says to the Sheriff of Kent, order upon sight, etc., by his bailiffs and others, whom he shall appoint in singular the towns and other places of Kent, for the king's money to be paid of the issues of that county, to cause six wing feathers to be taken of every goose, except those called brodages, some type of goose, uh, fittest for making uh, of the arrows for the king's use, and to cause the same to be brought to London before the 14th of March next as the king is shortly to sail to France for recovery of his rights and the heritage of the crown. Bear in mind that by this point he'd been promised, promised the crown of France. Um, long withheld and wrongfully occupied by the adversary of France, as all men know. And considering how the ki God, um, sorry, and considering how that God of his ineffable goodness and not for the king's merit gave him the victory by his archers, among others, with their arrows. Talking about Agincourt here. His will is to make provision for a sufficient store thereof with what speed he may for better furtherance, furtherance of his present expeditions. This doesn't talk about arrowheads, but again, in Henry V's reign, the supply of arrows was extremely important. And note, in an age when noblemen, kings and knights and, and great lords and barons were very keen to project credit upon themselves to claim uh, their own, um, you know, th their own deservedness of victories. In this document, Henry V is crediting his archers, <laughs> the lowliest in many ways of all of his soldiers, except for the, you know, baggage train. Um, so he himself credited the victory of Agincourt with for his archers. Now something that I found particularly interesting going through the English documents was that there was a sort of bottom heavy trend to the um, ordinances looking at the production of arrows and bows and supply of them, this kind of stuff. In the earlier period, so it's very clear that Edward III perhaps took it the most seriously. It was taken very seriously also by Henry IV um, and Henry V, certainly the um, supply, but we sort of see a dropping off of that as we go into the 15th century. And this, of course, has an impact on our interpretation of the archaeology, because it does seem to me that there was less emphasis in the surviving legal documentation, parliamentary uh, papers that we have available, as we go further into the 15th century, on the quality of the arrows as a whole and the arrowheads, which may suggest that when we're looking at something like the Battle of Towton Battlefield, 1461, it might be that the material of the arrowheads from Towton are not representative of the material of the arrowheads of Agincourt. Because there could be a situation whereby various royal decrees and a very, very developed um, uh, sort of supply network for arrows at the end of the 14th century and into the beginning of the 15th century had meant that they had very good quality arrows, potentially with steeled or um, case hardened or, or solid steel heads in the early 15th century around for the uh, Agincourt campaign, but th this situation, because of a degrading of the structure of society through the Wars of the Roses, perhaps that's conjecture, or the poor kingship of Henry VI, I think nobody would dispute the fact that various royal establishments and infrastructure crumbled under Henry VI, and this largely led to the Wars of the Roses. 
It seems also possible, therefore, that this constant battle that Edward III and Henry IV had gone through to ensure the supply of good quality arrows with steel heads somehow fell apart in the 15th century, so that when we're looking at the arrowheads from the Battle of Towton Battlefield, it could be that, yes indeed, they are all of wrought iron, because they're all of wrought iron, and by that point the supply and the legal um, kind of checks and, and um, consequences of not providing steel heads and the supply of steel heads had just broken down and they didn't have access to that many steel heads for the king's army anymore. Uh, and bear in mind, of course, that the monarch changed several times during the Wars of the Roses. So here we have a document from 1473 to 75, um, uh, from uh, so the time of Edward IV, um, and it says, to the sheriff, of London and Middlesex, order to cause proclamation to be made, um, for as much as the king prepareth by sufferance of Almighty God to take his journeys towards his realm of France. So this is the point at which they're now looking again towards restarting the Hundred Years' War. His old inheritance, for recovery there of his right of the same, with his host thereof ordained, considering that among other ordnance, bows and arrows be most specific, especially necessary. Therefore our said Lord commandeth that no Fletcher make any manner of tackle for shooting, but only sheaf arrows. That is, they stop making all, you know, hunting and target arrows. They only make military, what's sometimes called livery arrows today. And that all bowyers make their bow staves into bows. So they take everything they've got in their storeroom and they make them into bows now. Um, and uh, and that the bowyers and fletchers and makers of arrow strings and heads of bows, every of these as appertaineth to his occupation, in all haste possible, make and do to be made the same good and sufficient, so that no default be found uh, in them upon pain of the king's displeasure. So what Edward the Fourth is doing here is repeating old laws that have been. Of, pre of his predecessors, okay, Henry IV, Edward III, Henry V. He's repeating the things that have been said before, but he's doing it now for the first time. This is in 1473 to 5. So therefore, it seems like it hasn't been maintained. You know, it means that therefore he doesn't seem to have big, uh, you know, an access to a big store of bows or a big store of good quality approved um, um, proofed arrows with steel heads. This system has broken down, and all he's saying is, oh, uh, we need to restart the Hundred Years' War. I need to get my claims back in France. So all you bowyers and bowstring makers and, and fletchers, you need to make as many things as you can right now for the king's army. That means there isn't a pre-existing supply chain. So something has fallen apart, uh, which is my um, theory, and I think it's supported by the documents. The only thing he specifies is, oh, they must be of good quality, otherwise you will find the king displeased and I will punish you. It's far less specific than Henry IV or Edward III had been. And so I think this again just reiterates that he's trying to live up to the pattern set by his predecessors, but he's kind of new to this, and he's not really specifying the whole green wood and dry wood. He's not specifying the steel heads. Possibly by this point, they just didn't care anymore. And, you know, warfare had moved in various different ways. Maybe they just didn't think that steel heads were so important anymore, but they are not specified in this document. So to sort of sum up, I think what we can absolutely say is that for certain kings of England, particularly in the 14th and into the first half or the early part of the 15th century, steel used in arrowheads was important, as was good seasoned wood rather than green wood. They were incredibly concerned about the supply and storage of arrows in a way that doesn't seem to have been the case by the later 15th century. It seems that the tradition of manufacture and supply of the top quality equipment had waned. It had been neglected. It had fallen into, uh, into a some, somewhat sorry state by the Wars of the Roses. So it does seem that in terms of perhaps archers, perhaps the bows they were using, perhaps the quality of the arrows and the supply of the arrows they were using, we are looking at a heyday of English archery that is really in the middle of the 14th century, or even just before that, the 1330s, all the way through to about the 1420s. 
and after that it seems that it probably declined, at least if we can trust the written sources, the documents that we've got available to us. That might have an impact on the archaeology, of course, because that does mean that all of those arrowheads found at the Battle of Towton might be completely unrepresentative of arrowheads that, if they survived, we would find at the Battle of Agincourt Battlefield or the Battle of Cressy Battlefield. It might be and again, this is pure conjecture based on the sources, that we would almost expect most of the arrowheads at Towton to be iron, but a lot of the arrowheads at Agincourt or Poitiers to be steeled, whatever that means. And this is, this is the other uh, elephant in the room, is that we don't know what, you know, boiled and braised, well hard, steeled, what these various terms they use. We don't know exactly what they mean, but we do know we, I think we can say beyond any, any shadow of a doubt that it was important to them for some reason, presumably to do with penetrating qualities, that arrowheads be harder than wrought iron. You can't really make an iron arrowhead any softer than wrought iron, you can work hard on it, but by and large, if you're going to make an iron arrowhead harder, you have to introduce carbon to it, and once you've introduced carbon to it, the next stage is to look at hardening it. So how does this come back to arrows versus armour? Well, first of all, I think absolutely testing iron arrowheads is necessary um, because we know that iron arrowheads were used. We've got hundreds and hundreds of our iron arrowheads from Towton and elsewhere, other battlefields, and just found randomly with metal detectors. So we know iron, iron arrowheads were common. Equally, the fact that we've got repeated royal edicts and proclamations and ordinances talking about steel arrowheads and repeatedly saying how the arrows have to be of good quality and if they're not these are going to be the punishments that tells us that many of the arrowheads didn't meet the grade they didn't make the grade and people were making inferior shafts inferior heads and inferior fletchings sometimes as well so it tells us both of those things but it does tell us what they wanted and my overall question has always been, and in all of the videos I've done over the years about Agincourt and about bows and arrows and armour, with Toby Capwell, with Todd, with various other people, I've always made the point, if they were so concerned about steel arrowheads, that must be for a reason. I'll let you conclude, in your minds, what that reason might be. And I'm really, really looking forward to further testing that Todd and his crew and other people I know might be able to delve deeper into this topic and answer some more questions because we do have more questions. And just like you, I desperately want to see them answered. I hope that my historical documentary contribution to this has been useful. And um, yeah, check out the links below, document posted below, and I hope you've enjoyed this. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.